um, you'll have the PowerPoints plus the uh, recording. Um, <clears throat> so today's lesson is really on security ownership permissions and triggers, but I also wanted to pick up where we left off with searches because we were running out of time the other day, and I said there was a couple things I wanted to just uh, elaborate. So with that, we'll begin. Um, <clears throat> before I start, does anybody have any specific questions? And you could either chat or turn on your microphone. And as always, think about um, sending emails to me, and even after the workshop, of course, but, um, and we'll try to get them answered. Okay. Well, let's proceed. All right. So when we were talking about searches last week, we were saying how the search engine checks for different things. And really pay attention to those couple of slides in session four, because it's really important. People sometimes say, well, how did they find that? Um, and one of the things I mentioned was uh, besides certain strings, like I mentioned that if you're in a list search, if you have four pieces of text, four blocks of text, or what they call tokens of text, tokens, um, it assumes that's an inventory ID because it's made of four parts, okay? Um, but then there was also in the third section I was talking about searches, in general, it looks at certain fields designated by the DBA. And there's actually two categories of these fields, one of which are table um, fields that go into an auto search table. And there's a slide or two on that. And then the last thing I mentioned was that in SQL Server, you have the capability of turning on this full text, in, full text indexing. And quite frankly, I believe when the USDA started with Green Global, when we first went live, I'm not sure if they were using that initially, but they discovered that was a pretty handy tool. And so then they turned on this capability with the SQL Server database. And then they designated a few fields to be under the SQL Server's uh, full text indexing. And when they did that, they actually reduced or removed from their auto search fields about a dozen fields. So I think we went from 31 to 22. So maybe it's about nine fields. And then some of those fields, they turned on this indexing. And I'm not a, a big SQL Server person, so I'm not the wizard here, but um, anybody that works with SQL Server would probably be very familiar with this. And um, I mentioned at the bottom here, the table where you can um, get the information. And you could run this SQL and it, this query, and it will give you a list of those fields that are under the full text indexing. And I ran this last night on the uh, USDA, or yesterday, on the USDA production system. And so it looks like now, and it's a dynamic fluid type of thing, they're currently using 10 different fields that they've got full text indexed. And you can see the left-hand column is the table, the right-hand column is the name of the field. So I thought this would be useful for you if you wanted to emulate uh, the fields that they're using uh, for searching at the USDA. And um, with that, I'll continue on with a very quick review of the import wizard. And, you know, we talked about this in session four. We said it was a great tool to get some data quickly into the database. But I also said there's the caveat that this is not, it hasn't been kept up to date with some of the data views. And um, it's just not a perfect tool because for instance, it, it doesn't delete records, uh, but it is a good way, I said last week, for getting certain um, 
records in and out, particularly the code groups and code values. So that's one way. Uh, one way it's very useful. I also think it's another way it's useful to look at stuff. And um, let's uh, let's see what we got here. So, for example, the crop trait wizard. Um, I'm looking to see if Edwin's join is probably not because it's still early there. But um, let me just take a look at this for a second. So I'm going to uh, jump into the. I can find it. There it is. So import wizard is under maintenance. Uh, that happens every once in a while. Now, I don't know what happened to cause that, but I'll just quit, close it, and reopen it. Somehow, I think it loses its connection uh, to the database. Let me try it again. And I was doing some crazy things there a few minutes before I started. Okay, so again, import wizard. Good. So there's the database, it's localhost. And um, the example I was just referring to is the crop um, traits. And I'm going to view the existing data. Don't think I have any. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any in this database yet. But let me just point out, uh, remind you that the colors are indicating different tables. So in this case, the first two, and, and the reason I picked this crop trade as an example, it's one of the most um, involved relationships because you have the crop table, and that's what these two fields are from. And remember I said, if you click here, it will give you the name of the table. So that's the table, and that's the this is the table crop, and that's the field name. This is note in the crop table. If I click in here, I'm now in the crop trait table, and there's two category, two uh, fields, category and trait name. And then over here, it's crop trait length. So um, there are actually five different tables involved, and it takes quite a while to load crops and traits. And I'll make a, a commercial break here. Uh, I was hoping Edwin would be on the uh, line, but in the, um, the SIP folks created some wizards this year, and one of them is the crop trait wizard, and I've been testing it out, and it works really nice. So after you create your crop, uh, the way he's got it set up, you can uh, create traits, and then you, at the same time you're creating the trait, you can create the, the codes, and then you can also create the values for the codes. So um, that's essentially what this wizard is doing, uh, but Edwin's is more up to date. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you could go and load that wizard. And I gave you a link, I think, on one of the other sessions to GitLab that has those wizards. Also, if you go to Facebook in the Green Global Project, uh, Edwin advertises his different wizards. But anyway, I just, you know, here's a fairly complicated uh, set of tables, and the wizard was designed initially to load all this at one time. So let me go just demonstrate. I have a, a dummy file, if you will, and it remembers the last time from the last place that you imported from. So I have a, a folder that I've got all these files, and I, prov I provided these files for you. There's a link. Um, on the, the little web page that I made for this um, webinar series. In, under um, session four, I added a link to a zip file which has these CSV files, which are really just spreadsheets that are text formatted. And um, here's the crop. Okay. So you can see what it's doing. It's uh, pretty cool. There's the name of the crop. There's a note field the different categories, trait names, the language version, all right, the trait description, and then you're back in here, back to the crop trait, so that's why this heading is yellow. And um, 
you can actually use this to load some traits and see how, how well it goes. I played around with a little bit um, recently, but you know, it used to work uh, pretty well. So anyway, I noticed that it's not picking up some of my data for some reason in my field, I mean, in my file, it didn't pick up the code title. So this entire call, I just noticed this yesterday. So I'd have to go try to figure that out a little bit, why that's not picking that up. And again, uh, use this at your own risk because once you have data in the system, I would recommend, and you're using your system in a production mode, then I would only use the import wizard for reviewing data, not so much for importing data. Other than maybe the code groups, because that's pretty straightforward. So uh, let me just cancel. And again, just as a reminder, um, like, what was the one I was, I was, well, I wanted to see what kind of accessions I had in here the other day. Um, so you could go look at accessions. And um, here's one that's really, I was thinking about this when I was looking at this list. And again, the reason those are numbered is that was the recommended order if you were installing data into a fresh, clean database. In other words, if you were going to have name groups, code groups, site data, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a couple down here that are not numbered. And as I was looking at these, I remembered working with a, a former programmer who was with the Green Global Project. Um, and we had set up these in the import wizard, but now we have a different way of getting this data. But I realized that you could use this as kind of a tool when I select this import table fields and view existing data, look what you get. This is really nice because this is giving me the names of all the tables in the system. Because again, I was viewing existing data. I'm in the sys table table, and these are the fields that are in there. So that's the actual database names that are in the database. And then this is giving me the default friendly names. So we had this discussion about friendly names and there's two kinds. Well, these are the default friendly names that are in the database. So go back into the notes and look at the prior sessions about what I'm referring to. But this is where basically, whenever you create a new data view and it's using an existing table, these are the friendly names that will be the data views headings. And then we said, uh, again, in a prior session, that with the data view editor for a specific data, you could override these default friendly names. So again, I felt, I felt this was a, a nice little data dictionary, if you will. I can quickly go in and find all the tables, all the fields, and all the friendly names, including descriptions. So you, We've got about three or four different ways to get this data, but this is really simple. So I like that. Uh, do you want to ignore? Yes, I'm going to exit. So that was my review. And now I'd like to talk primarily about today's uh, topic, and that's the security model. And um, there's two broad concepts, really, when we talk about the green global security model. One is ownership. That is who actually owns the records. And then the second thing is permissions. And permissions is basically who can do what to records. That's how I think of it. So let's walk through this. I've got quite a few slides. And there is a lot of documentation on security in two places. One is in the old admin guide, excuse me, um, which is kind of detailed. Uh, basically, I interviewed the developer of the middle tier and uh, put a lot of notes in there. Also, uh, I have a re reference to a, another document, particularly on permissions from the curator tool. We'll look at that shortly. Let's see, I think I just uh, went backwards. I guess it would help if I just go to here. Make sure I'm in the right place. Whoops. 
Okay. I really did go. Okay. So back to the square one here. So um, the other thing, remember that the CT and AT work together in tandem. So the first question on today's quiz, how many owners can each record have? And it's real simple, one. And then that owner can always transfer ownership. And that owner can give permission to other people to do things to the records. So you can retain the ownership, but then set up permission rules so that other users can delete, update, or whatever. So this screen, it says here, is from the CT. So because both of these items in this menu are uh, able to be used, they're both visible and not grayed out, that would indicate to me that this particular record in the background where it says succession ID number one, that current owner of that record is able to, to invoke these two options uh, within the curator tool. If they did not own the record, this section here would have been grayed out. So again, generally in the CT, anyone could create a record in any table. And I'm gonna talk later about a question that Sarah raised, which was, well, can we set up read-only permissions? So let's save that for a little bit. Um, usually the creator becomes the owner, and I emphasize usually. That's not always the case, as we'll see. And again, you only have one owner per record, so that's the only person, if you're the owner, that can modify or update the record, unless permissions have been given to other people. So this last part of this sentence, um, many people can do it if the owner decides to. So I said, so this is not always true. So, you know, more than one person can update a record and, uh, and it all depends how, and we'll see different ways to set that up. So here's another tandem bike. Um, ownership works in tandem with permissions. So, <clears throat> It says here that much of the security desired is set within the curator tool by the owner of the record, assigning permissions to other users. Let me get a little drink, sorry. You know, when I was thinking about this uh, session, um, I guess I'm so used to working primarily with the USDA folks <clears throat> there's very little done to change the defaults of permissions. But of course, uh, but that is by the administrator. But of course, the, the version of Green Global they're using, they actually wrote. So you all may have different needs for your different organization. And so I'm going to show you a couple things you could do to modify the defaults that come with the Green Global. But, um, you know, back to here, this is the typical security wizard. And I'm thinking I'm going to go quickly. I think I have the curator tool open. Let's uh, go to here for a second. All right, so here's two accessions. And let me just see who owns these. for some reason that that happens. Uh, I've been told other people have seen this too. Did you notice that one field was not checked? I don't know why I've seen that before. Usually they're all by. So I wanted to see this very last column. I own those two records. I'm logged in as myself right now. Um, so because I own the records, I could select one or both. Um, Let's suppose I just select the top record. If I right click, it gives me the security wizard. 
And again, this is fully documented in a uh, document under user documents on the website. What I always tell my users is this screen, uh, start from the left, work your way to the right, and work your way from the top down. So in this example, there are two existing policies which I have created. So I could create another policy by clicking on there, and then it would give me another name up in this box. And then you can right click, and then you rename it. Okay, so I've created two policies already, and if I go to this one, I'm looking at that policy. Let's look at this policy. And then what I did was I set the permissions. Now, I wish other the screen were different, and I have this on the slide. I'm going to jump to the slide a second. These two fields make no sense to the curator tool. In other words, in Green Global, everybody can automatically read, so that really doesn't have an effect, nor can you create a record that already exists. Think about it, all right? So really, the only two fields that make sense are update and delete. So if I were setting this up, you can see in this case, I changed update to allow, and I'm not allowing this user to delete. I'm denying them that. So essentially, I'm setting up a rule here, a permission, so that the users here in this box that I've designated can update my accession records, but they can't delete my accession records. And not only my accession record, because that's where I was starting from, this was an accession record, but because I had also included the child tables, there are five different accession child tables, which also would be under this rule. And I said all of my rows, in this case, row is an accession record, and all means all that exist and all future records, okay? If I had specific records, then I would have selected that radio button. And then for the users, when you click, you get all the users in the system. You can pick and choose and add them to the right. And when you're done, you're done. You can remove and take them out. That's pretty intuitive. So that's the rule in this particular case. And I created this policy, and then I called it colleagues. Now, I'll come back to this later and look at it in the AT. I'm going to show you how you can find this in the AT. But again, right now, I'm wearing the hat of a user, a curator tool user. And we have found uh, within the USDA with hundreds of users that typically this is all you have to do primarily for security is have the users set the, these rules up. Um, when... Green Global went live at the USDA. We recommended each site to have their people who were responsible for creating records to go through this step and create a policy and pick the people in their group that they wanted to update their records. And um, they would do this really three times, once for accessions, once for inventory, and then once for orders. So unfortunately, it doesn't ripple down from accession to inventory. So you as a user, like if I were to do this again, let me cancel, I'm not changing anything here. If I went to the inventory uh, tab, and I, again, let me make sure I'm the owner of the record. I am. So if I right click, and go here. Now I'm looking at, <clears throat> let's add a policy for inventory. And it always comes up with the name security policy and a number. So I don't like that. So I'm just going to rename it. So that's the name I've created for it. And then again, if I wanted people to be able to update, it says inherit, and inherit means it's picking up whatever the database rules are. If I wanted to um, 
you know, specifically allow these people, then I would go in and select allow. Again, also for delete, do I want to let them do that or no? So in this case, I'm denying them the capability. And in this case, I'm saying all of my rows in this example, I've got inventory. So that means all of my inventory rows, inventory records. And then because I've selected the, the uh, child tables, there's quite a few child tables related, including, I'll come back to this, crop trade observations. And then again, you would select users, whoever you wanted to include. So uh, actually, let me go ahead, and I'll pick Donald Duck. And I'm gonna save this rule. So we'll come back, we'll find that later when I look in the AT and I'll show you how. <clears throat> um, again, this is the curator, not anything that the admin usually has to worry about. Although, what will sometimes happen, and I'll demonstrate this, is that the rules that the uh, user created may be conflicting rules, and we'll take a look at that briefly. So let's go back to the slides, okay. And again, I have a full document on this, and of course, anytime you have questions, feel free. But I always teach the uh, users, start at the top, you know, with the policy name, go to the right, and then go down. So the other part that users in the curator tool, they can easily do is change the owner. And that is so simple. You select change owner, you have two choices. First, well, first of all, you pick from the dropdown, the new owner. And of course, there's one owner per record. You can't have multiple owners. That's rule number one. And then in this case, it's pretty obvious what you're doing, either the selected rows or selected rows and children rows. Now in this case, it's unlike the permissions, you can't say all rows. I wish that were a choice. In fact, I think I actually put in a request to have that change included, but that's really getting into the uh, weeds and I don't think anybody will ever get to that. <clears throat> so ownership, typically it says here, sometimes uh, subsidiary table, tables have ownership that flows from the parent table. And we're gonna look at that now. Set up this way for a reason. So the owner of the important parent record would be able to manage the subsidiary child tables. So in the example I showed a minute ago, inventory had all those children tables. So the ownership of the children tables went back to who owned the inventory record. And there's this concept of what we call the parent owner. And I'm going to explain that now. So when I'm in the AT, I will see this kind of screen. So it's saying the accession action. Let's go look at this. So I'm going to go to the AT. Da, 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 da. Let's see right there. And we're talking about, um, what were we talking about? Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. What am I doing? It's too early in the morning. Table mappings, right. <laughs> uh, I had a little train of thought there. Okay. So when I want to look at this, I got to go down to table mappings, not permissions. Okay. And here's where I was. So I was looking at accession action, double click. And the second tab is relationships. So we saw this the other day, talked about that. But <clears throat> I briefly talked about this too the other day. So anyway, in this example, I'm in the accession. Let me open this a little bit. So I'm looking at the accession action table. The accession action table, as you know, its primary key would be called accession action, accession, uh, I'm sorry, it would, the accession action ID, but what they're saying here is that the parent and owner is the accession ID. So the accession record owns the action record, and that was what we wanted by design. 
If for some reason you wanted to change that, you could. My suggestion is <clears throat> I would leave all these various <clears throat> relationships out of the box the way they come when you install Green Global and over time maybe start to make some tweaks. And I'll give you a, an example or two where you might want to do that, okay? So let's go to the next slide. Whoops. So we're going to look at two examples where the user creates the record but does not own it. And we already actually talked about that a little bit, but I'll come back and look at it. Crop, op, crop observation records, and we're going to look at inventory records. But now we're going to look at it from the AT, from the, from the admin tool, okay? So let's go look at crop observation records. Let's do that here. And I'm hoping most of you are familiar with this, but um, there are two similarly named tables. The data table here is the raw data that in theory would be aggregated into the summary table. This is the one that's used by the public website. This is the one that uh, you record your observations for. And there is no true linkage between these two tables yet. But it is a good place to hold data if you want to keep it in the database. But let's look at this observation table. In this case, look who the owner is. The owner is the inventory record. I think I get this question not as often, but once or twice a month I would get this question, hello, I created some observation records and now I can't update the records, what happened? And the reason is it's the owner of the inventory record who now owns the observation record. So even though the, let's say it was a technician or an assistant or somebody who created the observation records and put them into the system, once they put it in, they couldn't change it. So either they have to go to the owner to give them permission or we change the ownership. So there's different ways to fix the problem, but that's why they had that problem. Okay. Uh, the other one I was going to take a look at is, okay, so this is what we just looked at. Uh, and we were here, right? All right, so I just wanna make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Now, this one's really interesting, okay? Inventory, and um, I'm not sure if he's on today. I don't see Mattia. Uh, yeah, there's a Mattia, I think, M.O. That might be him. Um, he was asking why we have the inventory records set up the ownership the way we do. And it's kind of interesting. Um, in the USDA, they had decided uh, years ago, instead of having the owner of the accession records own the inventory records, which you would think would be a normal thing to do, they made a decision not to do it that way. And what they had decided, so I'm showing you the default and I'll show it to you live. Let me go to an inventory here. So when you load Green Global, if I can find it. All right, this is the default uh, relationships, ownership relationships that come out of the box. And the parent owner is not the accession record, but instead it is the, uh, let me widen this, it's the inventory maintenance policy ID. So why did they do that? Well, it's because the way they're set up. In the US, there's 20 different sites where they maintain the germplasm, and each site has different species they're responsible for. But one of our sites is Fort Collins, and probably a lot of you are familiar and have dealt with Fort Collins. They are strictly our backup site where we back up most of our stuff there before it gets backed up again from Fort Collins and goes to Svalbard. But um, 
the lady, it's really primarily one person that maintains the inventory records in Green Global. They have the inventory there that they're backing up that she needs to maintain, but the actual accessions are out there at different sites. So this created a problem for her because every time she wanted to change an inventory record, she would have to go contact the owner of the accession to get permission to change the inventory. So that became a real nuisance. So what they did was they, they came up with this rule. They said that the, whoever's maintenance policy is impacting the inventory. And if you recall, you have to select the maintenance policy before you create an inventory record. So when she creates her inventory lots, she selects a maintenance policy, which she's the owner of. So now she also owns all of the inventory that uses that maintenance policy. And I did a little exploration the other day. She only has two policies. She has one for seeds and one for in vitro. And um, when she applies the policy to her inventory, she's the owner of the inventory. And then if she can change, she can update, she can delete or whatever. Now, you may not want that, okay? You might want to have the owner of the accession own the inventory. Well, here's what she would do. You would just go in here as the AT person, as the uh, administrator, and I'm gonna change this to just say parent. So I'm going to remove this parent child having the same owner. So now it just says parent, but I want the accession ID. I want the owner of the accession to be the owner of the record, of the inventory record. So I'm gonna go into here and make that the parent child have the same owner. All right, it's the only thing I had to change. So now, going forward in this database, if somebody creates uh, an inventory for a certain accession, whoever owns the accession owns the inventory. It's that simple. And um, I'm trying to think if I had an example. Uh, yeah, I'm almost sure I did. Uh, where is it? I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right, that's what I was talking about. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanted to show. Here it is. I'll come back to those slides. So in the database, I'm look. I'm looking now in the curator tool. And in this example, what I'm showing you is that I'm in the inventory tab and I'm looking at inventory records. Look who created this second record down here. The guy's name is Herman, okay? When he created the record, the record was owned by the owner of the accession. All right, and that's because of what I just showed you how in that changing the rule for ownership uh, for inventory. Let me go back. All right, so I get, uh, now I wanna go to inventory. So I changed this, I showed you how, and change this to parent, and then that's your results, okay. Now, you can always go see these ownership relationships. And here's the sequel for doing that. So if you just copy this uh, sequel, and I'll give you that as part of your homework assignment, you could run it different ways you can run this sequel, and it will tell you who are the owners of the records. Of course, the other way is just go in the AT and poke around. All right, now here's the big question. Can you change the owner when the owner is no longer in the organization? I almost get this question asked in every workshop when I'm teaching the curator tool. What's the answer? You should be able to put this in chat real quick. That way I can pause and get a drink.
nobody in chat. A little icon. It looks like a little bubble or cloud. Can you change the owner when the owner? Yes, yes, seen a ringer. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Yes, seen you get a candy bar. I'll mail it to you. Can you change the owner? And the answer is absolutely, because the administrator is the king. Right? The administrator can always change and go in there and anyone in the administrator group, uh, which is a good side note and kind of an introduction to groups. Uh, you only have one administrator typically, but you can add multiple people to the administrator group. So in uh, Beltsville, there's two people. Uh, Benjamin Haig is the Green Global DBA. Some of you knew uh, Quinn Senate and Benjamin is now the his replacement. Quinn retired, but also Kurt is an administrator. So those two have administrative privileges, and they can go in there and change things, ownership and so on. It's always good to have more than one person. So that gets us into this next part of the security model, which is talking about permissions. And in this case, we really have to talk about users, groups, and permissions. All three are interrelated. So I said earlier, what I think of as permissions is who can do what to a record, okay? Um, and those are the four things, read, update, delete, and create, right? So um, I'm looking, first of all, we talked about users in our very first session, which seems like ages ago. But in our first session, I taught you how with the admin tool you can add users. I'm not going to do that again here. But you know that you can do that with the AT. But I also have a note here. These two, don't ever touch them. Okay. So it comes out of the box with administrator and guest. Um, leave those alone exactly the way they are. There's also two others that comes. Uh, one, and they're both called something feedback. And uh, they're not even used by Green Global. They were intended to be used, and there was no code ever written around those two. I would say just leave them there, ignore them, don't delete them. So when you start up a new Green Global, see who the users are and just kind of make a mental note that you're going to leave those as is. Okay. And we talked about this in our first session, what you have to do to add a user. Um, you add all this information. And I also uh, mentioned that if and down here, there's a search button. If you already have your users in the cooperator table, it's a lot easier to select that person from the cooperator table and it plugs in all this data for you. So I typically use that when I'm adding, let's say, 20 or 25 users at a clip, I'll create uh, an Excel spreadsheet, dump that into the curator tool in the cooperator table, and then I go into here and find each individual, and then I make sure they have the correct permissions and groups, and we'll talk briefly about that now. So with groups, and again, I already talked about this. I got ahead of myself. So, you know, administrators, um, there's all these groups are in that system when you get it. All users, CT users. I, I um, kind of struck out those two, but that's the two that kind of are meaningless. They have no uh, redeeming value, but they're there. And then there's a web query users. And again, we talked about this in session one. If you want your internal user to be able to use the tools menu on the public website, you need to include them as also a web query user. Okay. So um, let's talk about permissions. Uh, again, we talked about the case where fellow CT users create permissions for other CT users. Now what we're going to do is talk about permissions being created by the uh, administrator. Okay, and we talked about this already. So we know the security wizard is where a user does this. And we saw this screen. And so now um, my note here is that typically this is sufficient, that a lot of times with the security um, 
permissions are given by the CT users to their colleagues usually is adequate. But let's take a look now. Um, and we're going to start uh, one of the problems that happens sometimes, and that's the bugging permission issues. Okay. Because sometimes people will call up the administrator or email the administrator and say, I don't understand this. Um, I thought I set up permissions correctly, but it's not working the way I expect it. So what would you do as the administrator to solve that, to, to resolve the issue? So the first thing I would do is start looking at the groups, okay? So in this case, in this example, uh, I am looking at this individual. So what groups are they members of? In other words, uh, the person who called you up might have said, Donald Duck is having this issue. I, he should not be able to delete records, but he is. He's able to delete records. All right. And so I go pull up Donald Duck as the user, and I immediately look to see what groups he's in. So Donald Duck is in one, two, three, five groups. Three of them, I or the first two are normal, all users, CT users. Okay. Um, every CT user, and I'll come back to this, is typically in all users and CT users. Now, it just so happens, I'm going to skip this third group, readers only. Um, in fact, I wish I had not included that in this uh, screen. But apparently, Donald Duck is in two other specific groups, one called Donald Duck and the other called Colleagues. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is, I um, uh, went in the wrong direction. Okay, whoops, let's just do it this way. Um, I'm now looking at the permissions for Donald Duck, and I see there are the groups listed again. These are all the groups that Donald Duck is in. Notice these permissions are in gray. That's because they're coming, these permissions are coming from elsewhere. It's, you can't change that because the person's in a group. In order to change the permissions, not for Donald Duck, you'd have to go in and change the permissions for the group. But we're currently looking at the screen for Donald Duck. And here's the conflict. He's in two different groups, one of which says he's allowed, and the other is deny. And for the same, it's kind of overlapping records. That It's like, which one of these is correct? Which one is ruling? And I actually did a test on this. Um, it's interesting but the allow actually won out. Um, the other thing you can do as the administrator is to then go look for those groups to find out what the permissions were. Now I changed the screen a little bit, but anytime you're looking at permissions, so I'm down here in the AT looking at permissions. Let me go live to show it to you. Let me go up to here. So if I go to permissions, all right, so I've opened up permissions. These are all the permissions that are currently in this particular database. Now, obviously, a lot of them say default. So they're defaults for each table, right? These apparently have something to do with the curator tool. And it looks like a lot of these are actually set up for the security wizard. My suggestion, never touch these, right? In fact, I wouldn't touch any of these CTs or defaults. But up at the top, I now have three different permissions up here, which I recognize what they are, the SW, I'm still trying to figure out what the W stands for, but the SW, these are the security policy uh, policies that were created by curators. In other words, um, here's the one I just created. I was logged in as me, 
and you saw me do this a few minutes ago. I created a security policy and I named it security demo IND1. If I go look at that, that's what it actually did. It set up this parameters. I don't know if I can, I can't, unfortunately, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So uh, it created a tag, which became the name of the permission. And that's read by the middle tier. So that's why that tag's always there. Every permission always has a tag. It then, in my example, I was applying it specifically to inventory. And I basically said, uh, I'm going to allow updates and deny deletes. And then I was the person logged in. And so that value there is actually 830 is my cooperator ID. So that's the rule that it created. Okay. So again, this SW is your clue as an administrator to know that that was a permission policy or security policy set up by a user. So in our uh, specific scenario here, Donald Duck was in two of these. If we go back and look at Donald Duck, all right, here's where the heck's Donald Duck, all right? And Donald Duck was in these two groups and that's how he got certain permissions. And there's again, the name of the groups and then there's that conflict. So if I were the admin, administrator, what I would do is go back and uh, explain this to the person who set up these rules and say, look, you've got this guy, he's in there twice. Or <clears throat> you could remove him right here and, you know, talk to the curator that, that, who, that wanted to set up these rules and perhaps uh, let's take Donald out of this group. So I could, um, I'm right here on Donald. I could go in here and um, and there was no description, but I can right click and remove him. So by doing that, I'm getting him out of the group that was conflicting with his other group permission. I hope that makes sense. So the point I'm trying to make is we do have conflicts. Ah, Matias says SW for security wizard. Yeah, so. That makes sense. I guess I wasn't thinking clearly this morning. I'm thinking of security policy, but security wizard. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. So I'm not going to change this. I'm going to leave it as, but typically I would remove this person from this group. So I'm not changing the group rules. I'm just removing this user out of the group. And that's the simplest way to do it. The other thing you could do <clears throat> is if it got really confusing, is to go in and take the user out of all the unnecessary groups and just make sure <clears throat> that they stay <clears throat> only in the default groups and then, you know, kind of add them one by one. I would say another caveat, um, we learned early on at the USDA is they kind of went overboard. Uh, a couple of the curators were starting to create all kinds of policies and they did exactly this problem where they were conflicting policies and they weren't aware of it. All right, so we've just walked through these slides, okay. Now, again, so the SW permissions security wizards were created uh, specifically by curator tools. And now what I'd like to do is talk about how you as an AT person can do things from your end, which would um, <clears throat> do more than what uh, a curator tool user can do. So you have more abilities, privileges, rights, whatever, you're king, okay? So you can go above just uh, allowing rows. You can allow rights to a table, or even all tables. And you can also <clears throat> set up for a particular site. So I'm gonna give you two examples 
And, and then I'm going to talk about a third case, okay, which you can't do. So how do you do this? First of all, you start by creating the permissions that you want to create. Then you create the groups. And then in the groups, you add the permissions to the group and users to the group. And then this is, if you think about it, a, per, a, a permission can be used in different groups and a group can have multiple permis permissions and multiple users. So it's very many to many type of relationship here. So let's look at two examples. So in this case, it says it's allowing access to a table. So the tag was called manage cooperator. So I, again, I would always create a tag. That's pretty much what the middle tier needs, okay? Um, you could put the same name if you want, but it has to have the tag. Now, um, it's funny. I was reading back in the admin guide, which I wrote 10 years ago, and um, it said something about the tags being limited to 10 characters, but that's obviously not correct because the tags are longer than that. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, um, in this case, uh, the other note, I'll have another slide, but um, as I go down here, I leave this any data view the way it is. In fact, um, it data views, it really doesn't work anymore, if you will. It's the table level that we want this to happen. So in this example, we're setting it up for cooperator, and what we're doing is um, we're saying for the cooperator table, anybody who receives this permission will be able to do anything to the cooperator table. So they will be able to create new records, read records, update records, and delete records. Now, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to give a person essentially any kind of permission to the cooperator table? Well, here's a good reason. And we bumped into this at the USDA. If you guys have been using the Green Global system for a while, when you have orders, requests for germplasm coming in from the public website, when you process those requests, in Green Global, what happens is typically, and especially now in the later versions of the curator tool, frequently what will happen is that that web cooperator who created a sign on and registered on the public website, when they submit their request to Green Global, it gets processed and two cooperator records get created in the cooperator table. So there's two different tables involved, the web cooperator table, which the public website user has access to. And then when you're making the order, when you're processing the order, you're taking that information they supplied on the public website and you're putting that information into the cooperator table. Frequently what happens is that data gets into two records for the same person. There's like a primary record and then a shipping record, a, a shipping address record. Now, compound that. Green Global is set up to handle multiple sites, exactly the way the USDA works, where there are 20 locations. So a public website requester can ask for accessions. And if they had asked for grapes, apples, hops and wheat, that request got sent to three or four different sites and it gets processed three or four times. It's not processed in one site. And in that, in that processing, we could have multiple cooperator records for the same person for different reasons. And I could uh, spend an hour talking about those. The bottom line is this, that we found that at each site, it would be helpful if one of the users working at that site could edit anybody's cooperator record. And that's exactly why we set up this rule. So we actually, and we just did this in the, and fairly recently, we just invoked this about six months ago. We set up a rule or a permission called manage cooperator 
and it's specifically to one table, the cooperator table, and then it's, you know, total access. Now, we don't give this permission to every user. So we actually had a training scenario where these users who were going to become our super editors, if you will, had to go through the training and we made sure they understood what they could do and why they were doing this and that sort of thing. So we added a group called, I think the same name, Managed Cooperators, put this permission into that group and then added the users to get those permission, to get that permission into that group. So if you were to look at the three or 400 users, how many there are at the USDA, there's a group called Managed Cooperators that has about you know, 15 or 20 people, and only they have this permission capability that they've been granted by the administrator. And uh, I just said restricted to down here. You don't have to do anything here. So this is really simple, and this is just for one table. So we've talked about this, don't change the data view, name and description are optional, and typically you're gonna have this enabled. Uh, if there is some reason why you were in a testing scenario or wanted to test things but not delete a rule, you could disable it. And that's what that checkbox allows you to do. Now this is another example of where the administrator would create a type of permission. And um, I need to double check this particular rule because this morning, and of course it was early and I only had one cup of coffee, I was bumping into a problem. But this is the rule that I'm thinking of, okay? In this example, uh, what we're trying to do is allow access for a site's records at any table. So we create a tag. In this example, the site code is NC7. I could have written names, I could have written whatever, but that's the site that we know it as. And we're saying in that site, in this permission, they're gonna be able to do to any table, updates and deletes. So I'm not changing the create or read, I'm leaving that as is, inherit. And, but then I go down here in the restricted to, and I'm going to set the site and the site ID equal to 16. If you were to look at the site table at the USDA site 16, the ID, the record for that site is NC7. So what we're saying now is whoever gets this permission will be able to edit records, basically updates or deletes for any records that link back to their site. And we give this out very cautiously. So uh, we actually have a super user, if you will, at NC7, and he really knows what he's doing. So he can go in and fix any record for his site. But I believe he's the one and only person who has been given this permission. So we don't give this out uh, very easily, okay, or quickly. Now, uh, Sarah, um, you asked a question the other day, you sent me an email and, and she said, the scenario that she had was she had maybe some student technicians or some group that they only want them in the curator tool to read only. And I have been asked this question many times and basically ignored it because I couldn't think of a way that we could solve that request. And I still can't think of a way. And I worked with Kurt Endress uh, last couple of days and we tried different things. In fact, uh, what we did was, um, the problem is this. It says here in this example where I've highlighted, users cannot be removed from the all users group as it is reserved by the system. So if you're in the 
I can't remove that. I can't take a person out of there. And that basically is giving you rights to all the different Green Global tables, however they're set up. Uh, let me demonstrate that. If I go to here and I wanted to take Donald, uh, no, let's take a different guy. Let's take this guy. And um, in the groups, by default, when you create a new user, they immediately get that. And then you typically add them to that. And then later on, this particular guy got added to another group. But in this case, if I try to remove this, watch what happens. You'll see that error. Do you want to do it? Yep. You can't. And so, um, so I was talking to Kurt about that because I thought, okay, if I can't delete them, then they're going to be able to have the typical uh, access to the tables. So he came up with a good idea, and I'm going into the weeds here a little bit, but we actually created some SQL to do it in the database and remove them from the mapping table to this group. And even when we did that, and I think I have a user maybe still set up, is it? Uh, it's this guy. So I actually took this guy, Reed, I called him for Reed only, and I took him out of any group except for the read only group, which I created. And even then, I was able to sign on as read in the curator tool and create new records. So even though we went through a roundabout way to remove them from the uh, all users and the CT users groups, they still, because they had access to the CT, because over here, we enabled them. So they have access to the CT, and this was a valid CT account. So wherever this logic is, is preventing a hiccup. And so, uh, so my slide, here's my slide for Sarah. Uh, not possible to be determined. So I'm going to still keep exploring this. But um, so how do we handle that? I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate question. And the answer I always gave everybody was this, and I'm still sticking to this story. Um, the USDA has now been using Green Global for five years, hundreds of users. Every summer we get a group of students working, especially at Ames. They have a lot of students during the summer. That's one of our largest sites. And uh, so what you do is the curator or whoever owns the records that they will be working with, typically, that's where you set that user up with the curator's tool permission to not be able to delete the records. So Mark Millard is the maze curator. So he takes and adds his technicians that he's going to be working with to his policy that he created in the curator tool that says, you can use my records, you can update them, but you can't delete them. And then at the end of the uh, summer or whatever, if those users go away, he doesn't have to worry about it, uh, but he's protected his records. So uh, we'll keep trying, but um, I can't figure, I've not figured it out yet. And I had the master working with me. Okay, um, this is kind of getting a segue, which in session six, we're going to talk about this screen under web application and different parameters that you can set up for Green Global. And there's one that impacts us here in this discussion. Let me make this larger. And it's a double negative, okay? The disable security is typically set to false. I always have to think about this, especially early in the morning. So if you change this to true, 
you have disabled security. And the only time that I could think when you would want to do this is in the beginning of setting up your database. In other words, you might want people to dump a lot of data initially before you go into production mode. So you could turn this off. It's the opposite. You turn, you disable security so you make it true. And then whoever puts in the records, they can update records, they can delete records. All the security permission stuff is not turned on yet. And you could, at that point, correct ownership and all that good stuff. Then when you're satisfied, then go back to this default. And the default is disable security false, which means that security is enabled. Why they ever did it this way, don't ask me, but it's, um, this is the default. Okay. Now the last section, and I only allow a few minutes because that's all we really can do with data triggers. So, I really just want to talk about what they are, where they are, how you can see them, and um, maybe I'll write in the code here. Uh, I'm not writing the code. If anybody, like I see that Edwin's online and uh, a couple other people that I recognize who may have gotten involved at this level, and my question to those who have been working with Green Global for some time, have you ever modified a data trigger? So the Edwins that are out there, the Graces, um, the Juan Carloses, uh, this is a yes or no question I'm posing to you. Have you ever changed a data trigger? I'm just curious. If you could do that in the chat. That's what I thought. So Simit and SIP have not changed triggers. Okay. So I don't want to dwell on this. That's why I didn't really allow a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, Mattia, that's what I expected. Mattia wrote that he wrote in that he read the code. And that's what I'm going to suggest to you all is as an administrator, sometimes you get a question about why did something work a certain way, okay? And people can't figure out the logic, like why did it do that? Well, the answer is it's probably in the trigger. And there are about 40 some triggers, really more than that, that come with Green Global. So my point of this little part of this is to say, where are they? what do they look like and how you can review them. Okay. So it's code, uh, the definition, it's discrete programming code that execute response to certain conditions or certain values in the database. Okay. So, you know, it's, um, before the record gets saved, the, the way most of these triggers work in Green Global is that the user inputs data in whatever particular table they're going into. They're in the data view, of course, in the curator tool, but it's going to a specific table. And then what's happening is the trigger is looking at the data that's going to be inserted into the database. It says, wait a minute, uh, we're gonna change that, or we're gonna do X. And that's what the trigger is doing. In other words, it's looking at the conditions in the incoming data, and then it makes some kind of uh, you know, evaluation, if you will. And I have a ex simple example of one. Um, so what it is, it's really a mechanism for developers to connect with the middle tier and adding some logic without changing the middle tier. So um, I've mentioned this before, the middle tier of the Green Global was written many years ago and we don't really muck with it. We don't go in there and edit it. It's been stable for 10 plus years. But over time, different requests have come in where they've wanted to change something. And typically the way they've changed it is by adding or modifying a data trigger. And so therefore it's simpler than changing the code in the middle tier. 
So these triggers are installed and they're installed by the Green Global installation and you as the admin person can enable or disable them. Um, and I really apologize because this is one of the things that I want to do and I, it's like one of these things and I swear I'm going to get to it in the next month or two. Our data triggers are not really well documented and I've tried and tried and tried. I'm not the programmer so uh, anyway, I'm going to do a better job and I'll put a document out there on the triggers. Uh, but you can look at them as Mattia did to, um, yeah, and Juan Carlos is saying the triggers are not really part of the database schema. But anyway, uh, you can look at the triggers and get an idea of their descriptions, but the descriptions sometimes just don't give you enough clue. And over on the right, you can see uh, if the trigger is turned on or off, okay? So is it enabled or disabled? And again, you can look at an individual trigger. So I'm looking at data triggers, the current one. Now there's like five of them that are labeled for accessions and they all have a class. And then it tells you briefly, here's the description. And this is where I was trying to get a, a lengthier description added to these triggers. Because to me, you could just put the description here and then you wouldn't have to have a separate document. So you can find a list of triggers by running this SQL, all right? So that'll give you the list of triggers and you could actually then dump that to a spreadsheet if you want to keep that. Um, you can also look at the triggers, all right? So I'm going to go to this link. So there, the source code is out there in the GitLab repository. Okay, and um, it has the last time they were committed, uh, last update. Let me go look at this action, accession action. Uh, is that the one I wanted to show? Now, again, we're not here teaching SQL and we're not here teaching C sharp or C whatever. So. But here's the code, here's the name, there's the class name of the trigger. Okay, so it was picking up that information when you were in the AT. And um, sometimes there's documentation. So in this case, there's a comment. It says completed date must be greater than or equal to the started date. And again, uh, not all of these triggers have that kind of documentation. But this is a simple case where you can see what they're doing. They're looking at the start date and they want to make sure that the started date, um, that the completed date is greater than the started date. So it's a really simple example of a trigger. And it has to do with the accession action table. Okay. So if you look at accession actions and you look at the records, there are two fields, start date and completed date, and it doesn't make sense that you could have them reversed. So this just guarantees that somebody won't make that mistake, the user, when they're in the curator tool. So that's an example, again, of what we were saying. When the accession action record is going to the database, this trigger is looked at, and it's evaluating those two fields and then if life is good, it lets the user go forward with recording that, um, that record. Otherwise, they will see a message and it will say completed date must be after the started date. So that's why it's helpful as an administrator uh, to look at the source code for these triggers, but you're probably never going to change the triggers. And if, um, I guess my suggestion would be if there was absolutely something that you needed, I would say suggest that to uh, Juan Carlos um, and we could add that. Where would one provide a French translation of this error message? <laughs> That's a good question.
I don't know the answer. I will look that into that. I'll have to get back to you, Mattia. Um, uh, it's obviously not language sensitive, and maybe you're pointing that out. <laughs> uh, that's interesting because the other day um, we were sent, uh, Juan Carlos and I were sent a screen that was in French, and <laughs> I went back to the user and I said, could you translate that in English uh, so that we could see what the error message was? But that was a different error message. Can I see it again? Yes, seen. can I see it again? What do you mean, can I see what again? Uh, you mean, will you get the error? I'm not following. If you went to change the record, 19 in the... In this file. I'll let you guys who are programmers answer this one. So I'm not following. Are you saying you've seen if you went to save the record again, would you get the error again? The only way I know is to test something like that. All right, let's do this. Jeez. What's going on? Ah. Well, that's interesting. Why did that do that? Too many things going on. You seen you broke my machine. Uh, I'll have to come back to you with that question. So let me write that. So I've got two questions: the French translation, and in this case, the accession action. What I was going to do is pull up, create an accession action, put the dates in reverse, see what happens, and then hopefully that would answer your question. There we go. All right. That's funny, I didn't really mean to do that, but um, let's do this, right click. There we go. All right, edit data, add a record, M-R, M-A-R, there's only one, all right. Select an action. Again, these are codes coming from the code group. Um, I archive this particular accession, and then I'm going to put in a start date of, um, let's see, 1231, and the completed date is 9-1. And I'm going to make this action visible to the web. And I save it. Completed date. So there's that message that came up from the trigger. There's an error encountered. Detail, okay, it can be hovering, da 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 da. We know that. So if we do this again, and I change this to 10 1, you're going to get that again. I, I guess I, I'm not. Sure, I, that's what I expected. Now, if I put the completed date to 1-15-2021, that's one thing it doesn't verify, that the completed date is in the future. I knew that was going to happen. So I don't know if that answered your question, Yassine. 
Uh, but I'd say yes, it comes back again. Anyway, we kind of got into that uh, longer than I expected. Um, so again, the triggers, you can look at them all. Um, sometimes it might take a better eye, somebody who's more familiar with programming, but uh, you can usually figure out what these triggers are doing if you look at them closely. So again, here's the name, the class, and um, one of the things that uh, they did, uh, they, they being the developers originally, is they created large triggers in that sense that there were all these multiple subsets of the trigger in within one trigger. And um, there's pros and cons to doing it that way. So again, here's five different triggers for accession. My hunch is when you go in there, uh, like that one, uh, let's see, Reno. Luckily, a lot of the names lately have given us a pretty good idea uh, what they do. Like this one is the non-PI data trigger. So I know what that is all about because I was familiar with the requests for that. Um, what happens when somebody has a, an accession with a P, without a PI, which is the standard at the USDA. But anyway, um, that's all I wanted to say about triggers. And uh, we're almost out of time. But um, I would suggest this. Um, any more questions, please send them to me especially we're running out of time between this session and the next session, which is Thursday. And um, not only about anything we've covered, but about anything that you can think of as an, as an admin administrator that you've been curious about or wondering about, because I'm calling session six uh, what to do, what you do when things go bump in the dark. I mean, basically, the way I set up the seven seminar series was I was thinking a catch all would be the last session because there's a lot of little miscellaneous pieces when you install Grand Global, both on the server and on the curators uh, or the user and the curator tool. And I just want to kind of go through all these different files and things you can do, and it's it's really a hodgepodge. So again, please send any questions or comments, and we'll try to answer them before, uh, or at Thursday. And then of course, there's always, you can follow up later. So that's it for me. It's nine o'clock my time, which the temperature might be minus one degree. It's a cloudy day. Uh, Juan Carlos, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Uh... Yeah, as, Ma as Mati say, the next session is the last session for all of this. It's important to, uh, that you send the questions for Martin before to the Thursday. Uh, if somebody has a comment, go ahead. If not, thank you for coming to this session, and we'll see you this Thursday for the last session of the webinar about the admin tool. All right. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks for coming and spending some time today. And you'll have homework soon. Okay. Thank you to all.